What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where you already know we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Today, we got a guest on that's got a crazy story. Spent many years of his life in prison, federal prison. We know a bunch of the same people. This brother ends up getting out of Big Sandy, and you know what? He's in the street, and something vicious happened, as you can see from the thumbnail. He's shot 10 times by a family member, and he's now in the hospital, laid up, paralyzed from the nipples down. But anyway, Larry, Tell the people who you are. Let's talk about you and let's get into your story, man. Uh, man, first and foremost, man, I just want to thank God for giving me this opportunity, you know, to be on here and try to help some other people, you know, not follow the footsteps that me and you took and a lot of other people that we know. Uh, but yeah, my name is Larry Walling. I'm out of Dayton, Ohio. I've been in the streets my whole life. I'm not proud of it. So that's not something that I want people to take from this interview. I want them to, you know, take you know that this street life ain't nothing bro there's no loyalty there's no real friendships there's no nothing man like so i'm just you know thankful that god gave me another opportunity to try to help some people and uh i did a lot of damage to you know my community from you know the way i acted and selling drugs and you know living that lifestyle man so yeah that's basically it Let's talk a little bit about you and what your life was like, Larry. You know, I know you were out there getting money at one time. I think you were all the way up at one time. What was life yeah. like, Larry, growing up? I uh, man, it's in a drug-infested uh, household. Uh, father on crack. Me and man, my dad did any drug he could do. He was a, a mean alcoholic. Uh, I was tossed around for family members and family members because I acted out and I was just... I was an out of control child. I started getting in trouble at around 12. I ended up in juvenile car incarceration, my whole juvenile life. And then went on, you know, to be a career offender and spend, you know, the rest of my adult life in there in jail. What'd you do? You Let's talk about this, right? I mean, you were getting money at one time too, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, always. And you talk about being a career friend. Did you do time in the state of Ohio? Yeah, I got five state numbers. Five state been, numbers. Holy yeah. yeah, man. Pathetic. What, uh, what ends up landing you in federal prison? We're going to concentrate on the federal prison bit a little uh, bit. Uh, my fellow, I got caught with uh, two pistols and $85,000. Two pistols and $85,000. Was it a conspiracy case? What was it? Uh, they was trying to build a conspiracy on me. A uh, few people around me had got murdered, and uh, they thought I had something to do with these homicides that had happened in my city that I had nothing to do with. So that's really what started my investigation was a couple of my friends got killed. And, you know, behind that, you know, you when you bring violence into the drug game, that's when the fans start fucking with you but it was some shit that didn't have nothing to do with me you know just people being caught at the like me you know what I'm saying I got shot 10 times I was at the wrong place at the wrong time we'll get into that in a minute you know I talk about Ace a lot in my book well not a lot but you know I highlight Ace in the book he ends up getting shot from the gun tower and he loses his life at Big Sandy you and Ace were actually pretty good friends right yeah that was my best friend Drew, growing up as a childhood friend Ace ends up in federal prison with like 300 years. You end up with five state numbers, a, a Fed bid. What was it like, man, when you heard that Ace had got popped from the tower and lost his life? What did you think? I was happy for him, for real, because I knew he didn't want to be here, bro. He was, I ain't going to say he was miserable, but I know Warren a long time. So anybody that don't know Ace, that's his real name, Warren. Uh, man, he just was a nut. And he, you know what I'm saying? Who wants to do 300 years, man? You know what I'm saying? I think the only thing that he enjoyed most was helping free all the people that he freed on the legal aspect. Because he was a beast with the legal work. As a jailhouse lawyer, he uh, he was good. You know? Yeah. But now that the law has changed, you know what? If he would have got his shit together and not been killed, he might have been able to get out of prison. I mean, I got out yeah. of prison before C-Stacking. Thousands of people have gotten out on it. And that's what he, yeah. he was banged up because of that. Yeah. Yeah, I know, man. But you know, the federal system is a different system, man. Like, my state system, man, 
it, it's it's hardcore, but it's like everybody's in the game, and I'm an independent. I represent independent and heavy. You know what I'm saying? I stand on my own two feet. I don't need nobody to tell me how to move or, you know what I'm saying? I've been doing this, like I said, I'm a childhood career offender, man. I've been doing this a long time, and just the federal system is vicious, man. Like, a lot of these guys don't know it. I'm like, man, y'all gonna go to go to prison and y'all fold or don't keep it real, or you might have a sex case in the past that you think they're gonna catch up with you. That shit catches up with you, man. So it's like the choices that you make now, you know what I'm saying? People be like, oh, it ain't affecting me now, but, you know, your choices can affect you later on in life that you make. Let me ask you this, Larry. When you go to the federal system, how much time are you sentenced to in the feds? I was sentenced to 89 months. Do you get an 89-month sentence? How old are you at the time? Uh, 27. 27 years old. You're walking in there with 89 months. Where do you go? What prison do they send you to? Straight to Big Sandy. Straight to Big Sandy. We talk about Big Sandy all the time. So, man, Big Sandy ain't like that. What was it like for you to walk into Big Sandy, being that you had been in the state system, and now you're walking into a federal prison, which is known for, you know, a lot of violence, the place where your best friend was shot from the gun tower and killed? What's it like for you to walk into that place? Man, listen, all I can tell you is this, right? As soon as you pull into that square... That little square block where they load you off the bus at, you you can feel the tension. You can feel the spirits. You know what I'm saying? Like you feel the negativity before you even step foot in that prison. And let me tell you, they had a Pisces that that rode in there with us, right? And he was like, I ain't checking in. He said, Man, I I'll sign the paper to go to the yard. Man, he went to this yard, bro. Let me tell you. You know, I was more fortunate because when I got the Big Sandy, I had uh, Bruce Young there, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Stevie Kidwell out of Cincinnati and Big Bo from Columbus. So I had a lot of good dudes that knew who I was that embraced me right away. So, you know, yeah, but I'm going to tell you flat out, the first thing they did was hand me a knife. As soon as I got there, my paperwork checked out. Same day, boom, here you go. And you go going to have that back. Let's talk about that Paisa. You said the Paisa said he'd go out there. Did he go out there? Uh, he went out there. We went out to, we went to dinner that night. And as soon as we hit that corridor, they smoked boy down. The Texas Emmys went that way and caught him in the hallway going up to C3. And they tore his ass down. You say they tore him down. What happens to him? Man, that shit, he got stabbed probably 40 times. Did he live or die? Uh, man, I don't know. I know that helicopter picked him up. You know, you smile about that, but do you, you know, sometimes you think you ever smile because of all the things you've been through. It's a way of kind of masking the pain, and you know, it is. Uh, and also, man, it's also knowing that I survived that situation and made that shit out alive, man. Just thinking, like, man, I think back all all the people that. Man, I was in Coleman, Florida. I watched the motherfucker get stabbed over a piece of chicken. We'll talk, about we're gonna, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Because we talked about some of the people that you were around. Like, I know Bruce. Bruce Young was a good dude. Had some hands. I think he had a boatload of time. But Bruce got busy. But, you know, even though Bruce got busy, Bruce ends up getting murdered at USB Pollock a yeah. few years after you after you separated from where he's at. Right? Glad he helped. Yeah, he got killed. Uh, dude, you know, he was uh, he was one of them kind of white boys that uh, he was anti-gang. You know what I'm saying? Bruce rolled by himself. He was a big independent. You know what I'm saying? And he really didn't rap independent either because, you know, independents are a gang. He was just straight solo. But I'm going to ride with Bruce to the wheels fall off. But, yeah, the stack dudes killed him, I think, down in uh, Pollock. We talk about this. I mean, you mentioned the sack dudes killed him, but no one's been arrested for his murder. No one seems to know who killed Bruce, right? Well, I mean, there's speculation, but no one's been, you know, hemmed up for it, right? No, as far as I know, no. I think that's mind boggling that Bruce gets killed in a federal prison and nobody goes to the hole. Nobody knows. They don't see it on camera. Isn't that kind of like a crazy thing? Uh, no, I mean, no, not really. It happens all the time. 
for instance, uh, you know, I'm gonna put myself out there a little bit. I, I, I'm I'm exposed, so you know, I was that big Sandy, and I ran the store. I had a few different things going on when I was there. I had my hands a little bit of everything: poker table, store, you know, change your name, and I was involved in it. Well, we had Ohio had a nice little car there at the time. You know, so you know how it is when you get 15, 20 dudes on the yard. And, you know, especially, and you know how big Sandy is, you got A units, B and C. So you don't never really see them unless you're out on the red cage, you know what I'm saying, through a fence. But anyway, this sack dude came in my cell. And he was a big dope fiend and shit. And his name was Jason Thompson. And, uh, any which way, dude come in, he wanted something out of my store. And I'm like, listen, bro, you already owe me 20 bucks. You know what I'm saying? You ain't got no money. You're $2,000 in debt on a heroin bill. Uh, I ain't giving you nothing. So dude pulled out a knife. We smoke his ass down. You know what I'm saying? We take the knife. Whether he falls on it a couple times, you know what I'm saying? Resting around and shit. And the same thing happened. Man, this dude... We went in his cell and, and and attacked him, right? And when we attacked him, it was in a cell and a white shirt was working this at working overtime actually. And uh so dudes in the cell laying there bleeding to death, right? So I ain't gonna lie, like I said, I only had eighty nine months. So you there, I called my homie to the door. He was a porter from Florida. His name was K. I said, hey, listen, man, I ain't trying to catch no murder bit, but dudes in this cell fucked up. I'm like, man, won't you do me a favor? I said, I know it's against certain policies. I said, but won't you just go, you know what I'm saying, let get the attention, you know what I'm saying, let let them know dudes in there fucked up. I don't want him to die because I knew he was fucked up and he had some serious issues with him. And... That's so we went and told the police, like, hey, man, dude's in the cell fucked up, but he's in the cell by himself. So you already know there's going to be an investigation because normally if he's got a bunkie, they're going to be like, oh, you know, his bunkie fucked him up. But anyway, when I came out of the cell and the two other guys that was with me, we, uh, I sent like four other white dudes into the cell after it happened. That way they wouldn't know who actually really did it. You see what I'm saying? So whenever they tried doing the investigation on us, because it was in the cell and there was no CC uh, video footage of us actually committing this crime that we supposedly did, they had to throw our shit out. So I understand that situation a lot, man, and I've seen it a lot. Man, I've seen so much stuff happen in federal prison, man. It's in some deep shit. Let me just clarify. We're going to get into that. Let me just clarify this real quick, right? Sack dude comes in your cell. He wants something from your store. You tell him, no, he pulls out a knife. He kind of... Yes, no, he didn't pull, no, he didn't pull the knife out right away. He came to my cell, and then I didn't like his attitude. So we went down to his cell to confront him. I was basically telling him, like, listen, bro, if you don't like what I'm doing or how I'm running my program, I said, I don't owe you nothing. I don't owe you shit from Adam and Eve. I said, so listen, we can go ahead and get this out the way and knuckle up. Well, whenever I said this, dude pulled his little banger out and we took it from him. And you know what I'm saying? Slammed him on the ground. I guess he got stabbed up in the incident a couple of times. Well, he, kind of on, he kind of fell on his own knife, right? Yeah, yeah, he fell on his own knife. Stuff like that happens, man. So after yeah. this happened with him, he's leaking. The police come. Do they take him out of his cell? Yeah, they take him out on the stretcher and then light flight him out in a, in a helicopter. What happens with the white dudes and the independents and the sack dudes now or the white gang members? Anything? Yeah, they lock up uh, They lock up all the sack members and all the Ohio dudes are completely off the yard, every one of us. Ever go back out to Big Sandy or you get transferred? Uh, no, they transferred us. They transferred everybody that was Ohio or a sack. Let's talk about some of the other things that you experienced at Big Sandy, and we'll get into where you end up going in a minute. You know, what are some of the things that you've seen and experienced there? You know, things that maybe made you say, damn, man, just want to go home. Man, 
like the, the a race riot that happened between the DCs and the Serenios one one year back, I think it was twenty twelve. Uh the DC black guy sold another Serenio uh fifty dollars worth of some bullshit heroin. But the DC shot caller already done told the DC dude don't be selling that shit, it's bad, and it's gonna cause a train wreck for us. Well, the Mexican went and pulled up on the black dude and from DC and told him, he said, Man, listen, uh, I need my money. And the Mexican said, I ain't paying you. So the DC dude pulled out a knife and stabbed him in the face. Instantly, the white dude, he's a white dude, but he's a serenio out of Detroit. He pulls this knife out and stabs dude. And let me tell you, man, I swear, I ain't never seen so many Mexicans come out of the woodwork in my life. I'm talking about they was jumping over tears. It was some some crazy experience, right? And the Mexican, the, the gang members that are white, they run politics with the with the Mexicans. You know what I'm saying? So if if a, if, if a Mexican goes uh, the white boy that's a gang member, he's going to ride with the Mexican because that's their color. You know they got a coalition. So it's like you know you see white boys getting in their shit, and it's like I ain't affiliated with none of this shit. And I'm definitely not about to catch no case from killing somebody over somebody else's heroin you know what I'm saying like I just saying I ain't into all that but that's one of the man I've seen many experiences man like since so a stabbing every day all you hear on lockdown all day long is motherfuckers cutting their bed and, and scratching the fucking floors sharpening knives you know what I'm saying so it's like it's a vicious cycle man I've seen a lot of people never make it out of there I've seen two three different people fucking you know catch Another case in there, I had a, my good friend Benjamin Raymond, man. He came to prison with, I think it was 11 years, and turned it into 33. And he wound up doing what you did. He just gave his time back, and he's home now. But, you know, if it wasn't for that, that plane that they gave y'all in the court system, he'd still be there doing 33. Let me ask you this. D.C. and, and the Serenios get it in. You said you've never seen so many Mexicans come out. I mean, are they out there stabbing each other? I mean, is it brutal? I mean, all stabbing, man. I wound up seeing dude in the red cage because uh, it wasn't maybe a month later that we wound up getting in an incident with the with the guy that I got into it with, and uh, basically, uh, I think this dude in the red cage, man, and he had so many holes. He was showing me all the holes, man. There were so many Mexicans stabbing him that this, I swear on everything I could ever stand for, man. This dude was getting stabbed in the feet that there was that many Mexicans stabbing him at one time. And no charges, no charges ever pressed. Isn't it crazy, man? I've seen dudes get stabbed 30, 40 times and live, and a dude get stabbed one time and die. Yeah. Yeah, man, I got a couple holes in me. I got a hole in my arm right here. That's the kind of stuff, you know, you see it right here. You know, that's the side of a bed rail in my arm. Yes, you did. They wrote me. Who stabbed you? You don't have to say that. Uh, it was, uh, I was, at, it was, uh, they wrote me to the, to the new Yazoo pen whenever it opened up. Uh, I left Coleman, Florida and went there. And when we opened it up, it was a wild spot, man. Listen, they only wound up riding, I think, 289 people in that prison at the time. Because it was so off the hook that they, they, they were scared to ride that, I mean, because it would have been like, it would have been a USP Atlanta is what it would have been. And uh, so I, I get, I'm in my cell making some food. And whenever I come out of my cell, the, the Mexicans are stabbing another Mexican up, right? So as I open up my door, I don't know that the commotion is going on outside. But when I open up my door, the Mexican that was chasing the other Mexican, you know, he hit me in my arm. Just a total innocent bystander. That, that's a pretty nice looking scar. It could have been in the chest, right? Yeah, hell yeah, could have been in my chest. After he stabs you, I mean, is there any issue now? Are you like, nah, man, a dude stabbed me, man? Like, it was an accident. It was, it was a total. You know what I'm saying? I just was coming out my door at the, you know, being in prison. You know, you can be in the wrong spot at the wrong time or any moment. For sure, man. I mean, look at look at you now, right? We'll, we'll talk about that in a yeah. minute, too. But, you know, let me ask you this, because 
I, I've said this plenty of times. You know, back in the day, the ABs, you know, they they rocked the federal system. But for me, it was the sack dudes, bro. The sack dudes were probably the toughest white gang. Um, yeah, I feel that way. And they do have a, a no drug policy, but some people do get high, and they're not supposed to. And and they, you know, sometimes they get at their own people. But after this incident happens, right, and eventually the independence, white independence, take over, like you said, the white independence become a gang. They pretty much take over, and they're probably the toughest white gang in federal prison system because there's 500 independents in every prison. Yeah. I mean, I might be exaggerating a little bit, but so after you, you know, this incident with that guy where he falls on his own knife, are you worried about going to the next spot that you might run into some of these sack dudes? No, no, I'm not worried about that. And to be honest with you, whenever I rode out, me and my monkey I had at the time, they accused both of us of being the ones to stabbing the dude, right? So they ride him to Coleman, Florida, too. He hits the yard, and he's out of Philadelphia. He's from Philly. He's a, he's a good old boy, man. I love this dude to death, man. And he's out on the yard, right? So the sack dudes, they confront him and ask him about the situation and shit. He tells them what happened, and they let it go. But then they find out that I'm on the way, that that's where they're sending me to. Well, they don't want me and him out on the yard. So they, they they talked to the investigator and basically told the investigator, like, if you let dude out on the yard, we're going to kill him. You're going to force us to kill him, basically, right? Which, to me, that's snitching. You know what I'm saying? And, our, and you, If you give up any information about anything that you're going to do to another person, that's snitching. But that's what all these guys that wound up doing this, they all wound up getting beat out of the sack gang whenever uh, they, clean, they clean, did the car cleaning and stuff. Because they felt like they had a lot of trash in their car. So these three dudes that actually dropped the kite on me, that's who it was. They all wound up getting beat out of the gang and having issues and shit like that. But, man, like, yeah, that's basically what happened. But So my homies, they they put me straight in the hole when I got the Coleman. And I'm back there for like three weeks. I'm mad as fuck. Like, man, let me out this shoe. Let me out this shoe. I'm not trying to be back here. Like, I'll sign papers or whatever. So finally, all the homies and shit, some of the, uh, my uncle Jack, he's been in the federal system a long time, so he knows a lot of people. And some of the mob dudes and shit that he was affiliated with, they reached out to me and, you know, all went and hollered at the institution and was like, listen, let dude out the hole. Like, he ain't, he's back in the hole for no reason. And uh, over there somewhere. Uh, but uh, they, uh, they basically uh, came and got me out of the shoe. And, you know, they throw me straight in the unit where all three of these dudes was. Straight in the unit. So I go in the unit and shit, and they pulled out of my cell. They throw me in the cell with a Georgia boy. And uh, they all three pulled down in the cell, and they're asking me, questioning me and stuff. And I'm like, listen, it was pissing me off for real that I'm being questioned about something that I did somewhere else anyway. So, you got a pants. Okay. You little shorts? Yeah. My bad. I'm trying to get dressed in a minute. Uh, but so, uh, anyway, so I'm down there. Shit, they finally get me out of the hole. I'm in, like I said, I'm in the unit with these three dudes. They pull in the cell. And, uh, you know, they, I'm, I'm, I tell them flat out, like, what's up? If you don't like what happened, man, I don't like it explaining myself. And, uh, so basically, I told him flat out, I said, man, we can hit hands up. I'll hit with all y'all, but I'm not checking in. I'm not staying in the hole. I'm not, you know, that's just not how I ride. And I told him if they wouldn't, you know, fight with a knife one-on-one, I just told him, you know, your dude was in the wrong, basically, and give me a heads up. You know what I'm saying? Don't stab me in my back or do no coward shit. And uh, so basically, they let it go. They felt, you know what I'm saying, like, dude pulled a knife out. And he got his own knife used on him. He was in the wrong. But he wound up hitting Pollock. They wound up stabbing him up, too. Stop you for a minute, right? Because I want people to know, right now you're trying to put your pants on and your shorts, but that's because you're paralyzed. Somebody's yeah. really trying to help you right now, right? Yeah, my nurse is. She's yeah. my second mom. How, how old are you, Larry? I'm 42. Larry, you're 42 years old. You've been through state prison, you've been through federal prison, and now you can't even put on your own pants, right? Nope. What's that feel like, Larry? 
Man, you know what? I, it doesn't. I, I I feel blessed that I got so many people that love me, and I don't even. This it's not nothing to me, man. It's just I'm a, I'm a survivor, and I'm a figure a way out how to do this, right. man. You know what I'm but, let me, but let me rephrase the question. Wouldn't you rather not be paralyzed by one year old? I think those of you watching right now that might be out there in the street and he might end up out in the back at 19 years old, paralyzed because someone tried to rob him or he tried to do a robbery and now he's not going to be able to put on his own pants. Man, all I can tell you is whatever God gives you or however he blesses you, to me, this is a blessing still, uh, Chad, because I'm still alive, man. Like, I'm still alive, bro. Like watching you seeing that video you said of, uh, of the church, man. Like that shit just made me happy seeing that, knowing that you know what I'm saying. You came from where I came from and went through all the same struggles and tribulations, bro. And look where you're at right now. You got to put yourself at peace with God, you know. And all I do is keep my pray alive, bro. And I'm thankful. Well, and, and I respect that 100. And I'm glad that. I'm able to get out and not be back in prison. I'm glad that I'm able to be out here and be on this platform. I'm, you know, hey, I'm not a Bible thumper, but man, I believe in God. I believe God helped get me out of prison. Let me let, let let's talk about why you're paralyzed. What happens, man? What happens, to Larry? Man, so basically, this is what happened, man. Like my nephew had a really good baby's mom, and they had been split up for like four months. My nephew was in a whole nother relationship with a, another female. So I asked him for his blessing to mess with his baby's mom. You know, they got two kids and stuff. So, you know, I didn't want to put myself, even though it's my nephew and I know her and I knew him, you know what I'm saying, and been around them, I still feel as a man, I'm 42 years old. And if you're going to be around somebody else's kids, you need to ask for their blessing first. And so I asked for it. He said, yeah, go ahead. I start messing with her. And my nephew goes on a 10-day uh, mess smoking binge and called me. He's like, man, I've been up for 10 days smoked out on ice with this bitch. And I'm like, man, I said, listen, bro, bring your ass to my house and go to bed. Because he had a key to both of my houses. Yeah, so my nephew, he comes over to my house at 6.40 in the morning, and he's listening in my window, and me and no girl just happened to be in there doing whatever we was doing. And he knocks on my window, telling me to open it up. So I opened up the window. I mean, I opened up my door, and I let him in. And he asked no girl some kind of question. I you know, I'm trying to put too much in detail, but he asked no girl a question and she basically said, told him like you ain't doing it for me like he does. So he got mad, he pulled a pistol out. I tried grabbing it. When I grabbed it, uh he shot me twice in my hand. Like I can't even use my hand. That's how my hands permanently stuck. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Look at that. Yeah, so yeah, you know, that is what I go through from being paralyzed. Though you know what I'm saying, I got nurses that help me out, man. But back in my story, like yeah, so we came in the house and shit. He pulled the pistol out. I seen him pull it out. It was dark. I grab it. I get blasted in my hand two times. The third shot hit me in my pistol in my spine. So. When it hit me in my spine, it dropped me like a sack of potato, man, like straight on my stomach. So uh, he gets over top of me, bro, and he starts shooting me in my back. He shot me seven times in my back and once through my throat. And, uh, yeah, basically, so whenever he did that, man, he's like, I'm talking to him still. As I'm bleeding out my throat, bleeding out my mouth and stuff, I'm laying on the floor talking to him. I'm like, I said, damn, Ferdy, how many times you need to shoot me, motherfucker? I'm like, damn, you done shot me. Plenty of times, bitch. Like I'm paralyzed. I said, you know what I'm saying? Like I was just speaking to him. 
and he still wasn't done. But luckily, my dog laid on top of my head. Man, this ain't no joker, though. That race long. My roommate's pit bull laid on my head and took the last bullet, man. Having your pit bull what? Laid on my head and took my last bullet. Oh, so you think he was going to shoot you in the head and the dog was there? Yeah. Damn, bro. The dog died? Nope. Nope. And she wound up chewing the bullet. Man, she chewed the bullet out of her own body, bro. Damn, bro. Let, 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 let me, uh, damn, bro. I mean, I'm kind of stuck for words. This is a hell of an interview. Um, yeah. I didn't know that you were ended up with, you know, his kid's mother and all of that type of stuff, but he shoots you like that, bro, and now you're paralyzed. You're sitting in the hospital. Where's old girl at? She still coming around? Uh, man, she got, she got mad because she, I had fucked it up a bit while we was talking. And she knew I was in the street. She knew, like, so she used that as, like, an excuse, but, man, like, her and my roommate both held my bullet holes until the ambulance got there. You know what I'm saying? Both the females. I was just so thankful, man, for real, that he shot me with all the bullets and didn't shoot the bitch. Bro. Yeah, we should stay away from the B word, bro. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right, man. Her, man. Listen, man, it's all, listen, man, it's all good. So, you know, he, yeah. he were you ever laying on the ground thinking like, damn, I mean, you're talking junk to him. You ever thinking like, this is it, man, this is where my life ends? No, I never, I never felt that way, bro. Hey, but I did see when I, man, listen, it's, it's hard to explain this more like, it's weird, man, because when I was laying there, the one person that came to me the most was, was my right-hand man's cousin. And I didn't have a real, I didn't know him that good, but I knew him, you know, on a, on a regular basis, you know what I'm saying? But my right hand man and him was real, real cool. His name was Big C. He's dead now. He got shot too. And uh, so basically, like, man, he came, to, man, I seen him and all. It was just crazy as hell, bro. He just kept telling me, like, you got to stay alive, bro. You stayed alive, man. You're alive, but you're paralyzed, right? And I know I talked to you the other day because after I talked to you, I kind of felt bad, man. I wanted to call you back. And I asked you, you think you'll ever be able to walk? And you said something like, man, pretty much if you don't believe it, no one else will. You believe in your heart that you're going to make it happen, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But super you know what? It got super dark in your room, man. What's up with the light? Uh, oh, that's a, man, my bad. I had this dumbass pillow in this. Can you see now? All right, I got you. My bad. Yeah, but man, like, I, I, I feel like I'm going to walk again. You know why? Because my faith. And my beliefs are so high, man. Like, you, it's like, man, I speak so much stuff into existence that it don't even make no sense. Like, bro, money, I don't never ask for money or none of this shit, bro. I'll be getting blessed with so much. I can just think something, I swear, God be blessing me, man. And it's like, I've been falling back on my prayers a lot here lately, right? And I need to pick them back up, you know, because my faith is all I got right now. That's the strongest thing I can have, man. Like, and the friends, I got some good friend support too, man. Like I get so many visitors, you know, people that come help me. I'm talking about homeboys that's taking me here to change my diaper. I wear a diaper right now. Oh, I'm in the diaper, brother. Like, and you know, I and I'm still humble, man. Like I'm humble as hell about this situation, man. I didn't even press target on my nephew, bro. Well, I mean, you said you're a street dude, man. You live by the gun, you die by the gun, right? Well, that's snitching, bro. And then the aspect of it, Lord, I'm not I'm not ever going to stand on trial for stand up and testify for the prosecutor. Never, ever. Well, listen, Larry, you know, look, I know you're trying to get some money together because you need to, what, get like a wheelchair thing and all of that? Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I'm trying to save my money up right now because I'm trying to get me a wheelchair lift that I can put in a van. And on top of that, I've been actually doing some research on some stuff on this uh, handicap transportation. 
I want to get into some handicapped transportation. So I figured they kill two birds with one stone. I can go get one of these big bands where I can go around and get contracts and be getting paid a hundred dollars, a hundred and thirty dollars to transport, you know, handicapped people, people in my situation. And uh so that's like a, one of my goals I want to do. So I got a so I got an income. I don't want to live off social security. And I definitely know what to be homeless and broke. So I'm going to do what I always do, find more grind. You know what I'm saying? And right now, I know that's a good grind right now. There's not a lot of people that's tapped into it. And right here in Dayton, from, you know, being transportated so many different times to the hospitals and nursing homes, like I see that that's a big shortage on drivers, you know, for nursing homes and doing that stuff. So that's like an opportunity and an uh, interest that I have I'm going to take. Listen, man, before we get ready to go, right, I'm going to I'm I'm going to shoot you a couple dollars on Cash App. I don't pay people for interviews, but I'm going to look out to try to help you out. And if you got, a, you know, your Cash App outposted or whatever, nasty people, man, they want to donate 10, 15, 20 dollars, whatever they want to do to kind of help you, man. Because I know, listen, man, I, you know, you say what you want and, and you understand it as a blessing. But, man, you're fucked up. Let's just keep it real. You're in a bad position. I'm in a bad position. Yeah. You're in a bad position. You can't. I'm so and I'm so independent that I took about the nurse wouldn't get me out of my in my wheelchair all when I I've been in this bed for thirty days healing from her bed sore, right? So I wanted in my wheelchair. I had restless arm syndrome, restless body syndrome. And man, I threw myself out of my bed on the floor, crawled over to my dresser, grabbed me an outfit out, and I was trying to get myself dressed and get in my wheelchair, man. I can say this for dudes that are watching women, people that been in prison, you know, we've been up against the wall, man. It ain't, it ain't easy, man. And you know what? You learn how to persevere. You learn how to get through things. You know, you, you figure things out. You're like, yo, I'm not going to stay here. Like I say this about prison. I'm not going to stay here and watch TV. I'm not going to stay here and be the dude that watches the movie TV all day long for the rest of my life. I'm not going to be here and be the dude that can get the best picks in prison and win a bunch of suits. I'm going to work on getting out of prison. And that's how I learned the law. The only way I was going to get out of prison was if I got myself out. And I feel the same way about you, man, that the only way you're going to ever walk again is it's going to be a blessing from God, but it's also going to be you. It's going to be your willpower. If you don't work, you don't eat. You know what I'm saying? For sure, man. For sure. Larry, before we go, anything you want to say, I'm about, I'll put your cash out, but anything you want to say to the people before we close? Yeah, man, I might put my number over here. You know, there might be other people that's handicapped or paralyzed or just going through a struggle, man, that, you know, need to talk to somebody else that's in that same situation would be a, you know, take help, take a barrier down out of their life, man, because I ain't going to bullshit you. I smile a lot, but at, uh, there's times I hurt. You know what I'm saying? I ain't went through that mental breakdown yet of, you know, actually realizing what the fuck, how serious the situation is, you know, let's start from our profanity, you know, but working on more. Uh, but yeah, just you know, if somebody needs somebody to talk to, or you know, ask questions, I want to be that person, man. I want to get back to my community. I want to, you know, I want to change. I don't want to go back to prison, man. Like, I got over twenty years in on installment plans. I'm cool on that shit, right? Larry, man, I appreciate you coming on, man. It's a hell of a story. It's a crazy story. Um, you've been some dangerous places. You've been through some things. You've seen some things. You've done some things. And now, man, at the end of the day, man, this is your story, man, where you end up shot at 42 years old by a family member 10 times, bro, and he wanted to end your life, and now you're paralyzed. I think some people can learn from you, and we'll post your number. We'll do all of that. But again, man, thank you for coming on. I'm going to tell people, if you like what we're doing, load all the Razor Wire TV with respect. Until tomorrow, we're out. <laughs>